Sunday. Yeah, happy Sunday to you too, man. This week's episode is a special one, close and very dear to my heart, not only because the human being that is involved, Ashley Osborne, but because her job is tour photographer, which is my job also. Yes. She is so cool. And I really feel like even though we've kind of been in close proximity through all of the touring that we've done, this is the first time that I really got to know her and got to have a real in-depth conversation with her. And she's so awesome. She's so great at what she does. And it was just a amazing organic conversation. I think we were just talking about that before we got on here, but it's probably one of my favorite conversations and I'm not a tour photographer and it was still I don't even want to say this, but it was almost as cool for me as it was for you. But I don't know. I don't want to say that. I don't want to go out there and say that, you know? (laughs) Yeah. No, I mean, I agree with you. I think she talked to us the way we want to have guests interact with us. However, most of our episodes have been so choreographed, I guess you could say. But hers was the first one where I was like, oh, this is where we're headed. Like, we're going to get there. But we just, you know, it just took us knowing somebody really, really well to come on and like kind of put us in that space. But it was nice to get a sample of what we're headed to. She gets it, you know, like, and I don't know this for a fact, but I could just kind of infer this, but she's done a lot of public speaking. She's kind of well-versed in what she does and how she does it. And she's very confident in her craft, which is like really nice to have someone come on here and kind of be like, yo, this is how it's done. This is how I do it. And then she has the accolades to back it up. You know, she's worked with some of the biggest people in fucking music. She works with All Time Low, Pierce the Veil, Bring Me the Horizon, Jesse J, just to name a few. And her accolades don't end with touring photography. Yeah. She's doing great. She's found a path in her career that worked even during Corona. Yes. And honestly, to be able to get to talk to her and pick her brain and kind of see what her day looks like on tour is a privilege for us and for you guys. You know, everyone listening, this is like not something that you usually get insight into. I mean, I know that Adam Amakias is one of the hosts of this thing, and he has some of the highest accolades of any tour photographer. He kind of started the game. He won't let me say that for him, but he did. And he's uh, basically organ trailed this whole thing, like went out and fucking forged the path for all these new photographers coming on. You went out there and got dysentery, you know, handled your shit, and you survived. You made it all the way to Oregon. Man, that game, third grade. Wow. The people that have played it, they know how hard that shit is, and you did it. You succeeded. Thanks, man. Yeah, also, a few special guests joined us this week because... Ashley and I have some mutual friends as long as and you do as well and they jumped on the call for a little bit so check that out but before we get to the episode and listening to all the wonderful things Ashley has to say Neil bring them home with our new patrons for the week we have Cedric and Jackie that's right thank you guys so much thank you Cedric and Jackie we appreciate you all right with that being said let's move on and listen to the wonderful things that Ashley Osborne has to say about being a tour photographer Dude, we're doing it. That's the goal. And they're not going to shit on the bus. You know? Well. Oh, I, I got to talk about Jenny Douglas. <laughs> I know her. She did Newfound Glory and other. Mm-hmm. She was my first like real TM on, on my first bus tour. And she taught me everything. That was the first thing she told me. <laughs> Paper, not in the toilet. Everything else, not in the toilet. Do not poop in here. Don't shit on the bus. That's our favorite name. The hardest sell to anybody who's never toured. It's like, yo, you got to check out this podcast. It's called this. I'm like, what the fuck? I actually had someone shit on a bus. I was on one. <laughs> oh my god! Did it work or what? What happened? Did did it explode and then everyone the bus never worked again? It was one of the worst days of my life on tour. I think I can't oh. lie. It was so bad. It was somebody's first tour and they didn't know better. No one told them not to shit on the bus. See, this is important and it's funny because they they always make it seem like the bus will explode and you'll never be able to work on there again and it's never gonna you know drive another mile if you do it. And they're like, don't do this. If you do this, four hundred dollars. The driver has to stick his whole arm in the side of the bus and then pull your poop out by hand. It's like, I'm like, oh, dude. It's like going over the fence in Sandlot. Yeah. It's like you just don't ever do it. It's not allowed. Although I feel like, are the bus drivers being overdramatic? That's what I mean is like. Think about how many people shit on RVs. That's like, I brought you know? this point. Yes, exactly. I just feel exactly. like the bus drivers are just like, listen, I'm driving your ass to do the middle of the night. I don't want to scoop shit out of the bus. Please just don't do it. I'm just going to tell you I'm going to lie to you because I just don't don't want to do it but also it stinks they take like a vow of like we will not Secrecy. tell anybody this yeah be, once you become a bus driver it's you're like once you rent an rv and you do it yourself you're just like you can shit on the bus an rv temple you mean pilot or loves yeah they all meet at loves on the second friday of every <laughs> <And they> all- <laughs> 
<laughs> make them out. Oh, well, we're off to a really productive This is start how we here. roll. This is the goal of the podcast. Oh, wait. Okay. I know how I know Ashley because we're both music photographers. You're probably the only person we've had on that I can be like, I actually understand her job. Other people, I just, I didn't know their job. But Neil, when did you meet first meet Ashley or Ashley? When did you first meet Neil? Do you guys know? We always kind of like saw each other in passing because you kind of worked with other bands we had toured with. But I'm not sure the first tour we did. I don't know if it was like. It might have been Warped. Everything starts on Warped, I feel like. Uh, or or Bring Me. Uh, you were with Bring Me when we toured with him, right? I was with Chiodos. Chiodos. I knew that you were on that tour. Yeah, it was fun. I mean, I was doing merch too on that tour. So I was like. Oh, wow. It was crazy. Yeah, it was fun. Is that how you met Bring Me? Yeah, I would literally leave merch every night to go shoot Bring Me. <laughs> Respect. God, they're, they're such a good band. I was like, I want to tour with Bring Me. And then I just shot them every day. And Nobody's selling merch during Bring Me set, too. Let's be honest. Everybody's watching the show. So. Well, I would always have someone watch merch. Usually Shelby, who was with Motionless and White, would cover oh, for Shelby's me. Sick. She's the best. She was like, live your dream, sweetie. Have fun. Well, it's sick that you could have that, you know, like someone you trust to kind of be like, can you help me? Because I, I care about this, but also like I care about that way more, you know, like <laughs> also don't steal this money, please. No, I would always keep my everything with me in my little fanny pack. One time I went to this merch booth at a venue. I wasn't working or anything. I just went to it. It was one of the opener bands and there was like a drunk guy at the merch booth. And I was like, what are you doing here, man? He's like, oh, they asked me to cover merch for him. Like they had to step out. I was like, okay. <laughs> and I went and told the band and the merch guy was like, we didn't ask anybody to do that. And this guy had just started selling their merch. And <laughs> I was like, and they had to go kick him out of the venue. I was like, this is really funny. That's how you become a merch person. Yeah, internship <laughs> right there. That's it. It was that easy. <laughs> the drunker I am, the easier it is to count. I sold 43 t-shirts and two were from this other band. I didn't even work for them. I made so much money. <laughs> oh my God. Well, that I feel like Warped Tour is where everybody kind of met. I miss it for that reason. I miss it for like, you know, meeting people that you might not tour with or I don't know, just meet everybody in the industry. Yeah. Every type of person. I miss it for, yeah, the same reasons. Just magical. Just getting to meet all these different people and make so many new friends and learn from so many other photographers and creatives. Every day is like a new opportunity to shoot something different. It was just there's nothing like it getting yelled at a lot getting kicked out of the pit it's like such a hard tour to do and it's like the fact that everyone's just doing it you're kind of like humbles you and like breaks you down it doesn't matter like what level band you are or like who you work for you're like humbled even like the biggest bands are like you're playing today at 11 a.m have fun i'm like i just woke up four minutes ago everyone's hung over yeah <laughs> I think the first time I shot A Day to Remember on Warped was 2010. No, it wasn't. You are, you guys were on Hurley, I think. 2009. 2009. Mm -hmm. I, that was fun, man. I loved that stage because it was yeah, like. Yeah, blow up top. It's the biggest stage. Was it? Yes. Bigger than main stage. Damn. That was a good year for us. Like we really were kind of coming into our own and I was probably like the skinniest then. Probably just continuously gained weight since then. Probably the best photographs were from then. Or that summer where you did Insanity. Oh yeah. I forgot. That was. Wait, no. You did. You were doing Insanity. Sanity in the summer on Warped Tour. Festival circuit in Europe. I was like, was... how did you even survive? My favorite time is when we did it above Of Monsters and Men at that Rock Retro in Belgium. And I think they wanted to kill us. But it was so funny because we had like a dressing room on top of theirs. Oh, no. <laughs> 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 I just remember Jared Leto giving us uh, macaroons from Paris and we were like at another place and he's just like, these are from Paris. You can give these to the rest of the guys. I'm like, how did you get these from Paris? He's like, I had my guy go get them this morning. And I was like, dude, you're fucking sick. And in my mind, he was like, I know I'm Jared Leto. And, and then you ate all the macaroons yourself. And then you did insanity. Yeah. I was like, guys, Jared Leto gave us like one macaroon. We'll cut it into 10 pieces. I might have eaten the rest. This is valuable content. <laughs> valuable content. How, how has, can I just ask how you're doing with this pandemic life being in Florida? Like, are you okay? How, like, how is everything? I think I had COVID. I don't actually even know if I've officially had COVID. I don't know. But I think I had it whenever I was in Australia in 2019. Like at the very end, we did December, came home. I was oh, super wow. sick. Everyone in our band got sick. And then everyone was fine. Like a week later, it was whatever. But this was before like COVID was even like kind of a thing. Like, like You brought COVID to the States, Neil. You just admitted it. I've heard other stories about this too. Like I have friends who were also sick in December, January before yeah. anyone really knew. A lot of people in New York too. We obviously have been like be very safe and very uh, respectful of like all of the rules and all that kind of stuff. But we, like we were saying earlier, we opened a restaurant, which was kind of crazy to do. And it's not like everyone makes it out to be like on the news, like where I live is like pretty progressive and maybe like outside of 15 miles from where I live is absolutely not progressive at all. The most wild fucking mad 
Mad Max shit. <laughs> it's crazy. But yeah, in our little bubble, it's pretty good. So. Oh, Florida. With that being said, how did you get into touring? <laughs> Before you toured, how did you get into <laughs> the music industry? Like, what was your... Speaking of Florida. <laughs> yeah, speaking of Florida, how'd you get in the music industry? Before touring. Like, I wasn't there a step between? No, there was. I mean, I think it was just being in Minnesota and Minneapolis and the music scene there and kind of how involved in, in that I was and how much I loved going to shows and was just like a really emo kid that went to a super inner city high school where there was really no one. I had like no friends really in the high school I went to because it was just not, there was no one like me or no one really liked rock music. So I had like a really small group of friends, but then most of my friends were at shows. So that was just kind of like where my sanctuary was. Like a lot of people, I feel like everyone was in the music industry, especially in our world, is really similar. And I just started to get more involved and just ended up doing like obviously going to a lot of shows, but was doing a lot of like street teaming stuff for labels and just was really interested in it because it was really just where I found like a home and had a community. So it was like street TV for Fueled by Ramen and stuff like that. And then kind of, I always had little point and shoot cameras with me in high school and was just always taking photos of my friends and family and stuff like that and thought that my $100 Kodak point and shoot was the shit. Probably was pretty cool. It was pretty cool. I wish I still had it. But I would always take photos at shows. And then I remember our 2009, 2008 or 2009, I was at a Paramore show who obviously fave band. And I was talking to a photographer named Joe Lemke. I know Joe. Shout out Joe. Shout out Joe Lemke. So he was just the first person to really take the time to explain to me like what getting a press pass meant and like how that worked. I think he was shooting for alternative press, which I was like, holy shit, that's awesome. I didn't, I had never really realized that was like a job. They're like the holy grail then. Yeah, exactly. And But then it was also like discovering Adam's work too, like played a huge part in me wanting to be a photographer because you were kind of coming up during that time. And I remember seeing your stuff on Tumblr and shit like that. So yeah, it was all just kind of a love of music and then graduated in 2010 and moved to Chicago and got my first real camera when I graduated. I used all my money to buy a little Canon Rebel XS and I thought it was the biggest deal in the world. And then when I moved to Chicago, I started getting press passes for this, like for local music blogs on Tumblr and stuff. And then, yeah, just like started my own zine eventually. And through that, I started being able to interview artists. Shout out highlight. Shout out highlight. Yeah. And and like there's people that still work on highlight, which is amazing. And yeah, so that was like how I started. Catherine Powell actually really inspired me a lot back then because she was doing a magazine and was like interviewing. And I, I realized I really loved interviewing and actually wanted to go to school for journalism for a minute. But Columbia it was just a whole journey in Chicago. Yeah. Started the zine, started interviewing people, started photographing more artists and, you know, making really amazing connections. And then just kind of along the way met artists who were just just really kind and for some reason really liked my work and just started handing me opportunities and working with me. So it was, it was a it was a journey. Craig Owens being one of the first people to have me shoot. That's awesome. Yeah. Back in like 2012, he discovered my work because I shot them at Riot Fest. You guys played that year too. And uh, he discovered my work through then and we shot together at the end of 2012. And then he ended up bringing me out on Warped for a while and I did some stuff for Chiodos. And then they were ended up being the first real band to take me out but well like big to on my first real big tour but there was other stuff kind of in between i'm not doing a great job with this time no you're doing great i was gonna say that like you mentioned that you know all these people liked your work and they brought you out but i think it was probably that they liked you too like i think that's a big part of it as well and i mean we all know like looking back it's like i feel like we all learn we're like wow i can't believe everybody liked my work back when i was shooting you know at this point like i hate my work from six months ago so i'm the same yeah i think it all still really surprises me like i'm just really grateful that I mean, I'm even here. It just, I really was just like a really sad Midwest kid who really, really loved music and being around music. And I never really ever expected it to kind of be my whole life. So I think when I talk about it, it's just like really nice to kind of reflect back. But I always get like really weirdly emotional talking about my life. That's awesome. Yeah, but it was cool. It was literally just networking and talking to people in Chicago too, and just becoming more involved in that scene, which had a lot of like pop punk bands and stuff. So I was shooting a lot of those fans and trying to just literally shoot everything I could for any price. Like I just wanted to work and 
and meet new people and be at show. Literally how it all started. I feel like Chicago is like one of those hubs yeah. for music. It always meant so much to us just because like Victory was from there and they were very important to music from that era and a lot of bands that really made a huge difference in the scene and a lot of people too. Like a lot of my friends that I still am friends with kind of came up through the Victory machine, you know, like maybe started off as an intern and kind of went through their whole thing and just learned what the music industry was from probably... I will say this, like Tony Romo is a smart guy, but he's, you know, he's Tony Romo, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's probably like, it's a crash course of like the hardest way to get into the music industry. But like, if you can make it there, you could probably make it anywhere. It's like warp tour. Yeah. It's the same kind of thing, you know? So really quick, short timeline. So end of 2012, I dropped out of Columbia. I was going for PR. I had done a PR internship at Victory and I thought I was going to be a publicist. Like I thought that that's what my life journey was for the longest time. So I dropped out of school because I literally just couldn't afford it anymore. And I was working at Starbucks. Victory was just a huge part of my journey. Like the people I met there, what I learned, it gave me really tough skin for the industry. Like it was, it was just a really important part of my journey. I am really grateful for it too. And like how much it inspired me at the time. And I just thought it was the biggest deal ever to have an internship there at, at like a label. Like I, being from the Midwest, like never having been to LA or New York City, just, it was just a really big deal for me to have the opportunity. So it was cool. I always was jealous growing up in Florida. I was like, man, I wish I grew up like near here because it seemed like every show happened there like you had every size venue you had like house of blues you had like all in orlando the, yeah the metro well i mean in chicago and oh well, in chicago. yeah in orlando too but i was always jealous like no one ever came to florida the cool tours like went to atlanta and they're like no thanks we're not going down there i felt that way about minneapolis too there were a lot of tours that would skip us so i would always go to the rave in milwaukee and see shows there or chicago yeah are you so you're from minneapolis yeah born and raised so it's like literally four letter lie yeah yeah, dude, Station 4, Triple oh, Station Rock, four is let's the best. go. Yeah, I miss it. Which one is that? What's it look like? It was downtown in St. Paul. Then they turned it into a jazz club and now it's closed. Well, it had it was that venue that had like the stage in the back, but then it had and like the, the poles in the middle. Yeah. I think I went there for a holiday show with like them and like sing it loud and definitely was it camera can't lie. What was um that really good photographer that was from Colin Hughes? Yeah, Colin. Yeah, Colin is a badass photographer. Yeah, he's my there favorite. There's so from many the good world. photographers from Minnesota, Wisconsin. It's amazing. Maddie. Yeah, come on. There. There's so many good artists like music photographers art in general from that area it really felt like it was nurtured up there and it's pretty badass like i mean frank lloyd right let's go come on yeah yeah you love the frank is he from minneapolis i don't know he's got a bunch of buildings there so oh no madison i'm thinking of madison sorry come on man that's my hometown pride don't take it away from me love madison I, you know my other journey out of out of high school was supposed to be me going to madison i wanted to become a nurse and i wanted to play fast pitch for madison that was my original journey in life play what for madison fast pitch like i wanted oh, to play, nice. I, I thought my life was going to be playing fast pitch and becoming a nurse. Wait, like, I don't know what fast what pitch is. <laughs> What's fast pitch? Fast pitch softball. Oh, what is that different than normal softball? Yes. Faster. Okay. I should have inferred that, but I just did not. I'm like, my knowledge of sports is limited and my knowledge of sports that aren't the big three is even more limited. That's okay. Dude, fast pitch is hard. Yeah. I was in, so into sports for a while. Yeah. My journey was almost playing fast pitch, becoming a nurse, and then I somehow ended up here. <laughs> so. Man, you've had a lot of endeavors. I'm glad you saw through it all and found such a you know one that you love so dearly not saying that you didn't love the others but you know yeah what made you change from sports and nursing to music like what was the was there like an instance that yeah I literally shattered my finger playing fast pitch and I never wanted to ever touch a sport ever again so then I, I took that was junior year of high school so then after that happened I spent all my time going to shows again and that's when I started just taking my camera to shows and like becoming more obsessed with music. So my whole senior year was like music, 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 music. And then I got into Columbia and was like, I'm going to go for marketing and PR. But they also had a entertainment management thing, which I thought I wanted to do, but not for me either. So that's a tough one to, to do. Columbia is like a really nice art school. I only, isn't it in downtown Chicago? Yeah. So expensive. Yeah. I remember hearing Still about paying it. for it. Are you really? Oh my God. Yeah. I never even knew Columbia was in Chicago. I always thought it was like in Ohio or something. 
No, Columbus. there's a lot of Columbia's. Columbus, like I'm just in, toured all over the world and I'm so, like when it comes to school, I'm like, I have no idea. Yo, one time when I was on tour with the data, remember we played at a school or it was like a Rise Against tour and I went out to the cafeteria and I was like, oh fuck, you're so young when you go to college. I always thought it was so old, but then you're like, I don't know. I never went to college. So when I went there, I was like, oh wow. I didn't either. I stopped going to high school, so I, I can't even be a part of this conversation. Oh, I didn't know that. I literally stopped going to high school and joined a day to remember after 10th grade. You were 16? I was 14. You were 14? <laughs> Yeah. You were a baby. Does that mean Alex was 12? Alex was not in the band for like a number of years. Oh, okay. Alex was 12. Alex was a fetus at that point. He was barely uh, dude, even alive. Alex is amazing. Oh my God. That's crazy. I didn't know he was so young either. Yeah, he joined when he was 15. So we, we actually uh, took him out of high school and we asked his mom, we had to go to dinner with his mom and be like, hey, can your son come on tour with us? And she's like, no. <laughs> and we're like, we're really good guys. I am basically like old enough to be his older brother so we're gonna take really good care of him me and josh kind of were like alex's older brothers and then his mom's like okay fine but he has to be back for school in two weeks and we're like yeah sure that's gonna happen oh my god i didn't know that that's amazing hey it worked out it was crazy you gotta take the leap enough about me i know but i think on that note like i guess the next part of the story is how i was working at starbucks from like every day in 2013 from like 4 30 in the morning to one and then i would take a nap and shoot a show pretty much every night and through tumblr had met lynn gunn from paris through like a mutual friend and they ended up being the first band to offer me a tour so paris and i did our first tour I together love Paris, she's so badass in 2013 we were the first of five bands and it was a skylight drive headlining with wolves at the gate i the mighty for all those sleeping and Paris being the opener band on that tour and, and we did it and I did merch and tour managed and did photos. That's and what it that takes was, though. It does. I quit my Starbucks job and was like, I want to tour for the rest of my life. That's when it became like a real thing. You were getting paid or was it like per diem or were you like actually making like a salary or like how did that work? She had to load the van and then they gave her dinner. I think I can say this. We were making like a hundred bucks a show. Like it was like, we made no money. I was getting like a $5 per diem. Yeah, literally. Literally. And then my tips for merch, which were actually great because we were a baby band. So what'd your tip jar say? Yeah, I have a oh, good say. I don't say. remember. Yeah. I think it was Polaroids of the band. Oh, that's cool. That is cool. You were creative directing even back then. It just wasn't a title yet. <laughs> your tip jar needs to look on brand. You know, we were trying. It was like the coolest thing. Still my favorite tour I've ever done was that tour. It was my first time seeing the whole country. That's awesome. The craziest stuff happened and it was a lot. It was the hardest tour I've ever done and the best tour I've ever done. So that's that was what made me could be like, I gotta go. But I just wanted to tour so bad. <laughs> I gotta I gotta quit my life and do this forever. Man, you really had like all of the like best starter things to get you into this industry and know what to expect kind of because it's like from there, it's only getting better, right? Like you did all of the hardest stuff. And then you're like, well, I could do this. And I love this. I like doing this. And then you found like good positive things in the hardest parts of the journey, I feel like. And that's pretty yeah. rad. I mean, you guys know, though, like touring in a van, like that shit was the hardest thing I've ever done. Like, it's hard. Being at venues with like rusty, disgusting bathrooms backstage in one green room, nowhere to shower. You either don't shower or you shower at a truck stop. Like it was a lot. Did you wear shower shoes? Of course. Still do. Never will not wear shower <laughs> shoes. We ask that question to everybody who comes on here, usually at the end, but that was a good opportunity to sneak it in. Uh, yeah, it was. I, I saw the opportunity. I'm like, well, we can't bring it back. Back up at the end. There was a time I didn't have shower shoes and I literally showered in my socks because I was like, there's no fucking way. That seems worse. No way. No, I was like, I'm not. You. That's like doing laundry and showering at the same time. That's great. <laughs> my bare feet will not touch this floor. <laughs> like, no. Just get out and dry them out. You're like, yeah, clean socks now. Just rinsing them in the sink. Pretty sure that's literally what I did. So that's how life was back then. Uh, that's we how were... it is. There was a time where we were like, we just started being able to do well, like being able to pay ourselves. And I remember just being like, I am throwing these socks away and I'm buying new ones at Walmart and I don't care. That's awesome. <laughs> and I don't care. Yeah. In my mind, I'm like, God, I can't waste this money. I'm like, this is the only money I'll ever see in my life. I can't buy new socks every day. That's when you've made it. I actually saw that on MTV Cribs. It was like, I don't remember who it was. It was like some R&B singer. I want to say it was like Usher. He's like, I wear a white t-shirt every day out the packet and I throw it away. And I was like, damn, that's sick. I want to do that. And then I like realized like actually like how wasteful that is. I'm just like, no, nah, I can't do this. This is ridiculous. Oh my God. Yeah. Remember when things were just, when dreams were felt just that achievable? Like, just, that's when, all it was? Yeah. Like, the I most, like, just want a new t-shirt every day. 
Ugh, just let, I want to wear it out of the pack. I even hate t-shirts out of the pack. It's like they don't They're ever. They're itchy. There's... He did that every day. What a psychopath. Who even? I'm like scared to admit that's what I used to do on a day to remember tour is. And I, I used to buy Hanes packs and just wear the white shirt. I feel like you wrote about this on a blog or something once. I swear. You didn't have a suitcase. Yeah, so I'd buy it on the road. I just remember realizing it was weird when I ran it by, actually in Chicago, my friend Aaron, I was staying at his place and I ran it by me. He's like, you throw them away? I was like, yeah, I need to go to Target and get some more. He's like, you wear, you throw them away? And I was like, yeah. You don't have anywhere to put them afterwards because you don't have a suitcase. Yeah, I got, I got lenses. I don't have room for shirts. I got glass. Adam, you were like, you were the first person that I knew that was like the most minimalist person. And the only thing you had was gear, like photography gear, and you protected it with actually your life. Actually, back me up on this how i get i mean listen it's so hard also as a woman just having to not overpack my shit because it's like when i would go on tour i'm flying with my fucking massive think tank roller bag and i've got either another suitcase or a duffel and it's like having to be minimal while traveling with all your gear as a photographer sucks because if you're in a in a band you just have one or two suitcases but no we've got like a 60 pound fucking carrying case and he's a semi truck for his gear what do you mean no i mean i can't imagine being like all right let's go on tour and it's like me with my guitar rig like <laughs> yeah. tied to a rope behind me and i'm just like walking or you know what i mean it's like i can't you guys literally did that you literally showed up and you're like i have everything i need to do everything i need to do with me right now but it was so uncomfortable every time showing up especially when i was like showing up to work for an artist for the first time on tour and i'm showing up with like my actual suitcase and this other suitcase and a backpack and i'm like hey i live here now yeah on this I mean, moving house that's what it has to be right yeah okay so now that you've like done all this stuff to get you ready for touring and you get on the road and i know you tour managed and did merch and did all this other stuff but what do you think tour what are the, <laughs> yeah tour managed you know you did, you did the best of your abilities what uh what skills do you think you have that kind of make you a good i don't know photographer other than obviously taking good photos is there any skills that like made you that instead of a tour manager yeah no i mean there's a lot of things that i learned especially on that first tour i think just on the note of touring as a whole, like touring taught me more life skills than anything else ever will. Like I learned so much just about patience, coexisting with people, just literally everything. I mean, I grew up an only child, so I just had never like living with that many people on a bus. Like it just taught me so many life skills. But I think the reason I ended up a photographer is just because just calling myself out, like I'm not good at many things. <laughs> I'm terrible at numbers. I'm terrible at budget. I'm just not my brain. Like I have ADD. My brain is just not, I cannot do those things. Me counting in merch was like the worst part of my life. Like I just, I'm not, my merch trailer was so unorganized. Like I'm not the kind of person who can do that, just be that in those roles. Like I'm just not. And I had an eye and I knew that I, I could do it if I really just kept practicing and teaching myself. And there just was no other route for me. <laughs> there was this is what I was I got. not going to ever be the person doing spreadsheets. I was never going to be the person counting in merch because I just can't do that. Also, I can't like me dealing with people all day, every day at the merch booth was just so mentally and emotionally exhausting. Like it's a lot of work. And I'm just, oh, yeah, can't even I'm imagine. so much happier behind the scenes in my own little bubble, doing my own thing, being a fly on the wall. Like I really do thrive in that environment. I just love being invisible and just like capturing moments and just doing my own thing. I loved being on the road so much and I still hope that I get to for those reasons. I just think it's like the perfect thing for me. I really love it so much. Bring back touring. We need I know. you. I hope I just answered the question. I just want to know. No, you did. Tangent. For sure. You did. It, you did great. It was awesome too because it was like kind of an explanation but also kind of a story and also kind of like a reason why rather than just being like, you're good at, you know, Lightroom and stuff. Uh, so you should be a photographer. There was nothing else that I loved doing more. There's never been anything else in my whole life that I've ever loved more than taking photos. Like that's just always been it for me. It was never, and I'm sure you can relate, Adam. It's like, it was never one of those things where I, I thought about it twice. It was just like, I always wanted to take photos of everything. And it, it was never like, this is my career. Like it all just kind of happened on accident. I never really thought it would be where I would end up. But I think all these little things happening along the way kind of just led me exactly to where I needed to be, which is really cool to think about. I mean, I can relate. And I know Neil can probably relate to, especially when we were in our younger age that like yo we literally didn't we're not good at anything else like i am not exaggerating when i was in high school i was like everything else in my life on paper was a failure
year. When I found photography, not only was I bad at it, but I was like, I was going to say good, but I was really bad at it. I just wasn't as bad as everything else. Like, and I was like, oh, I can stick with this. Like, and I actually liked it. Like it wasn't painful to do. It made me feel like I was playing a video game. I was like, I'll do this all night. Let's go. But I feel the same. Yeah. I just want to say like seeing both you guys' work from kind of like early stages of your career from afar, you know, and Adam closer. Much closer. But what, me saying that is like you guys had what is required and like sometimes like you can have these things that are taught, like you can teach someone how to edit a photo better, I feel like, or you could teach someone how to you know, set up lights better or whatever. But like you guys both had an eye and it didn't matter like what gear you're using or whatever. It was like you could see it and be like, that's a good picture. That picture makes me feel something. And it was like you noticed that even if you guys are hard on yourselves and say like, oh, our shit sucked or whatever. But I mean, because I get that, too. It's like our early stuff. I'm like. I won't even be in the same room if someone's listened to it. But <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, I understand that. But you guys, you had what couldn't be taught. You had the eye. You had the thing that is important. It's good it can't be taught because we couldn't learn it. I also feel like there's an element there too where it's like, I realize, I think all creatives, and I've said this a million times and I will always stand by it, but I think all creatives are really like empathetic people who have a lot of feelings. Like I think all artists are, like every creative I know, like either struggles with their mental health or is really emotional or really like, we're all just like so special and like built differently, literally, like every creative person I know. So I think for me, it, it kind of all kind of started from that from me just from empathy and like wanting to be capturing those emotional moments and that's kind of why I always like went towards heavier music was because I just felt like it was more expressive I guess that was a whole other tangent I just went on but I mean it is it's it's just a, an expression of feeling or and obviously the better artists are better at expressing it in more complex ways or I didn't finish high school so that was about as deep as I could get with that my stepmom explained the creative thing to me one time and it finally clicked for me because what did she say well she worked for Kohl's and in the marketing division for a, a long time Time. And her job was to basically, she would work with the creatives and she would work with the, I guess we can call them suits or people who, you know, they're not creatives. And she would hate whenever they would talk directly to each other without her in the middle, because the suits, the creatives would be like throwing their emotions, being like, I came up with this idea and this thing, and it's, it's going to be great. And the suits would be like, nope, next. And she'd be like, don't talk to him like that. You're going to crush him. That's when what you were saying, I was like, oh, I know what she's talking about. That's badass. Mm -hmm. It's so true. I can't remember what we were just talking about and why that just came to my mind, but it has to be hopefully related to what we were just saying. I think we were just saying like, you know, photography is a broken down into a bunch of different things that you need to be good at or things that you can learn and get better at. But like, I think one fundamental thing is like, you got to have that thing that can't be taught, which is the eye or whatever. And you were talking about what drove you. Yeah, I just wanted to capture emotion. I wanted to capture what these artists were feeling because that's where I felt my community was and we were all there for that purpose. So being able to document that and capture those emotions and those moments just like was so important to me. I don't know. It's it's really just crazy how things have all ended up exactly how they're supposed to. And I really appreciated this conversation just because it's made me like reflect and feel really nostalgic. So thank you so much for talking to me about all this stuff. I think that that's the coolest part of the podcast format as you can kind of have these longer conversations that are not like this isn't going to fit in a vine yeah there are so many young kids out there right now who are in high school and feeling exactly how we felt in in those days like i wasn't good at anything and like i didn't know what i was supposed to do and even sports like i love sports but i fucking was not good so it's, it's interesting and i think being able to share the story and talk about this stuff is just hopefully really gonna some kid in high school who feels like they don't have a purpose will hear it and just feel a little more heard and understood because I just that was totally me at that age I just had no idea what I was gonna end up doing with my life it turned out pretty okay I'm pretty stoked on how everything's turned out this episode is really important to us not only because we have you on but because a lot of our patrons or like the people who are really invested in the podcast are photographers and it's a product of you know that's what I do and I think it is that a lot of the people who are chasing to get on tour want to get on tour are photographers and I was wondering before we get into your daily routine of being on tour if you could speak a little bit more about how viable or how realistic you think it is for these photographers to maybe start off doing another job and then navigate into photography do you think it's like crucial for them to just get on the road what do you think like really helped you kind of get out there because that's the hardest part for a lot of these people absolutely yeah and I think like what's really cool is when like 10 years ago when we were starting that journey like social media 
media was nowhere near as important as it is now. So I think there's more opportunities now than ever for people to get on tour as content creators, which is amazing because the content creator market is just so much bigger than it used to be. That's massive, huh? But I think like the greatest thing I ever did was just say yes. You know, and, and there's so many conversations about like the financial aspect of this world, which we can definitely get into later. But my biggest thing was just saying yes and like getting those opportunities. And like, yes, I made five dollar per diem a day on my first tour, but like it launched my whole career and it was an investment in my life and a, in a whole learning experience that I would do over again in a heartbeat. That being said, like I said, my first tour, I was doing all these other jobs because that was the only way that I could really get on tour was just the willingness to get out there and learn. And then with Chiodos, it was the same thing as I had gone out for like a week or two with them as a photographer on Word Tour. And then they offered me a much like larger amount of money to come out and do merch and photography. And there was only one spot on the bus left. So it wasn't like I could just come out and not do one thing Like they needed somebody to do both. And I know a lot of photographers who started out doing merch and photo too. So I really felt like this could be a really good launching point for me and just getting on the road in like working so closely with people like Jenny Douglas, who was my first real tour manager and was ma- tour managing Chiodos, being able to work with her every day and like see her routine and learn what a tour manager does and being a merch person and then learning and like being able to ask questions and just being in that environment taught me everything I could ever need to know. And what was really cool is like, I remember on the Paris tour, like I, I wanted to learn lighting. Like I wanted to learn how to do like live lighting. Thought it was really cool. So like I would ask people questions and they would always be willing to help me or teach me something. And the first tour manager that I had, Jimmy, was tour managing a Skylet Drive on our first tour. And he would always take the time to help me because I had no idea what I was doing as a tour manager. And every day I would go to him with questions and he was so patient and so kind and was like so helpful. So I think that's the best part about the touring community is that once you get yourself out there, you can really learn anything you want because people are usually always willing to help you and like like help you expand and help you learn and give you advice. And like, I really always felt it was a really nurturing environment for that reason. Like I felt like I could have learned any job if I wanted to. So yeah, I think just getting out there and I feel like you'll relate to this too, Adam. It's like once you're out there, more opportunities come up because you meet so many new people and people are just really friendly and really cool and always willing to have a conversation. And, and like, I remember it was like 2013 or 2014. I had my friend offered me a spot in their bandwagon to go out on work tour for a few weeks. And I ended up staying out almost the whole summer just because I kept shooting for people and meeting people and having all these opportunities. And then from there, it's just like, it snowballs and snowballs and snowballs. It's all about networking and like who you meet and people you take photos of and investing your time. And it, it's easier said than done. And, you know, I was really lucky to be privileged enough to save money and from my Starbucks job and live in a loft in Chicago for like $300 a month. And that was why I was able to just not have to worry about making as much money in the start of my career. So I was really fortunate, but it was just like, once you get out there, it all snowballs. Like you just got to put yourself out there and, and talk to people. I feel like Neil can relate even on the networking thing with just touring with other artists, even on a band level, right? Like you meet a lot of people on tour, you probably tour with. Well, I was just going to say from that other side of it, you know, meeting people and being like, oh, she's working for this band and they like having her around, you know, like even just that little thing kind of gives you a leg up from over someone who's like not already out on the road, you know, like Mm -hmm. they can do it. They are around people and they're all having the best time and then it's working. And and that's the thing a lot of times is because you do live so closely with people is like, are our personalities going to work? You know, like, are are we going to be able to be in a van together? Are we going to be able to be in a bus together? And because everyone is different, especially creative artists, people, you know, you said we all are special in our own ways. And it's true. A lot of us are difficult to be around. It's a lot of energy. You know, and, and kind of seeing other people, like seeing it work and like seeing other people's work and then seeing them every day and being like, oh, they killed it on that tour. They definitely can do it. Let's ask them. Let's do it. Let's try this. That only happens from being out on the road. And that only happens from being around. Working really fucking hard and like just shooting. And and Adam, I know you can relate. Like every time I saw you on Warp Tour, you're running around like a crazy person shooting every single band, shooting every single person, saying hi to everyone. Like you were the guy. I looked up to you so much for that reason. And just like how you put yourself out there and how you documented people. And like, it, it was really awesome to see. And it inspired me a lot and like taught me a lot about how to navigate the industry. Just seeing you, your work. 
work and like everyone you were shooting and watching your journey. So it's like, that really is just how it works. Like get yourself out there and just work your ass off and shoot everyone and everything you can and like share your work and don't be afraid to share your work with people. Like I would tweet photos out and tag the artists and just like constantly was just trying to get my work out there. Throwing it into the world. Like, Hey, you know, Hey, I took this photo. Like, yeah, no, that's great. Great advice. And thank you for the compliments. I appreciate it. Of course. I've taken so many pictures from Instagram and like reposted them, giving credit to the photographer and just from seeing that they did that, like tagging me in it and being like, hey, check this out. I'm like, damn, that's badass. I didn't even know you were down there. I was obviously like headbanging or something or whatever I was doing, you know, <laughs> and then you see it and you're like, man, this is amazing. That is the beauty of social networking and, and doing that and not being afraid to kind of share your work. And we've pulled photographers too. Like I know that it was a little bit different. Like I was out with you, but you know, that's how we pulled Alexi. I met Alexi on tour and you guys needed somebody and we're like, oh, let's pull Alexi because he's a great photographer and he went on tour with you. That's how we got a lot of people who maybe would come help for the night or shoot for the night. You know, Grayson will come out and shoot. There's just all these people that will meet on the road. And then whenever in that area, the band will be like, hey, like, let's get that person to come shoot. And then they'll come out and shoot. And we've been thankful enough that you've been able to be with us and you've been willing to kind of spend your career with us. And because you could have gone with anybody, you know, like she was saying, like you knew everybody and everyone really loved your work. And we were lucky enough to kind of have you. And then the times that we couldn't have you because you're literally could work for anybody. We were lucky enough to kind of meet people like that. Find Alexi and, and have those people that were like, yo, your work is super inspiring. What would you say about jumping on tour with us? And it's normally like kind of that quick and that easy. It was not even much more thought than that. It was like, hey, you're really good. You want to do it? We like what you're doing. You want to come? And people were like, yeah. Well, for me, it's that easy. I'm sure it was like a lot more that went into it, like emails and shit, whatever. But I'm like, <laughs> we love them. Let's have. They said, yes. All right, put them on a flight. Let's go. I think it's cool to have an artist perspective on that here, though, too. It is like that, though. I mean, it really comes down to, in, well, at least for Data Remember, it's really like, are they going to get us and not think we're weird? Because we are. And we have like such a weird sense of humor. And we have like these inside jokes that literally are like 12 years old. And Adam's just now starting to get some of the jokes after we explain them to him. Not because he couldn't, just because they're that weird. And they're that like, like Seinfeld type of shit. I don't even shit. know what you're talking about. I feel like if they happened, I'd be like, oh. See what I'm saying? He doesn't even know. I know the whistle. We do have a whistle. We have a whistle, Ashley. What is that? One, two, three. You just screw with me. Come on, dude. I didn't want to like blow anyone's eardrums out if they're like. No, it's like, yeah, if you see somebody else trying to tour with, you just do that. And then, you know, like, or you go in a hotel room, like hallway and you do that. And then, you know, that somebody's like around that, you know, you like will be in a hotel and they'll be like those big open hotels. And you'll just hear like a whistle and you're like, look around. And you're like, where are they? It's like a little alert, like a little ping. Like, oh, one of the people I tour with is close by and they want to talk to me. That's so wholesome. It's so weird. Oh, we gave away our whistle now. Adam, you always had the most amazing connection with a Dater member, though. Like, they were always the band you went back to. They were always, for me, and I could always tell that you enjoyed working with them, not to speak for you, but more than literally anyone because your work for them was always like completely next level and you shot so much and you were always on tour and I, I could just tell how much you loved it which is why I always loved seeing you guys work together we're so passionate about it and so excited every time you talked about it it was cool well, thanks well we always got in trouble because we and I don't know if it's like a thing like we always like made <laughs> friends and our touring crew became family you know and like almost sometimes to a detriment like people would get too close to us just because we just they were like our friends like no you have to work you guys have such a good crew though i just remember being on that tour and really like i had my favorite tour i've ever done but i was so busy that i never got to hang which sucked but i just remember your whole crew being so cool and so helpful and so kind and the vibes were just the best we we really pride ourselves in them like and not and not even like to take credit for their actions because they choose to do that every single day and they are amazing but we really love that they extend like that part of our brand out and kind of are helpful and are welcoming to anyone that has a question or needs help or whatever it's like adam's always come to us he's like do you care if we shoot for this other band we're like dude yeah like do it. Adam's like, can I sell my t-shirt? And we're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. Adam's like, hey, I made you a book. And we're like, dude, thank you. <laughs> Yes. This is so wholesome. I love Adam Exadata, remember, for life. But I appreciate it. Adam's blushing, but we can't tell. Kind of makes me on un- yeah, right? Let us compliment you. God damn it. <laughs> it looks weird releasing the podcast with other people complimenting me. Like, come on, guys. No. The other day, Ashley, I was like, Adam, me and Ashley are actually going to ambush you and the, you're the person that we're going to interview. We should have. 
So Adam, how'd you get started? <laughs> okay, well, now that we've gone through everything, almost. When can I get a lens bracelet, bro? <laughs> okay. Dude, Adam gave me lens bracelets, and it was one of the highlights of my life. I'll never forget. You gave me a whole bunch, and I was like, I'm Adam thinks I'm cool. Like, this is the best day of my life. There is an amazing, important lesson in there that when he was getting started, is like there wasn't a lot of money in that area. A lot is an overstate, and there's no It was no hard money. to justify for us, too, because it was like, we're not like bringing me the horizon who's fucking massive on social media we never were and adam had to like teach us i literally remember him being like guys oh, yeah. we did have coaching yeah it sounds like a joke but we're like all dorks so we're like i don't want to post pictures of myself like it's weird i don't know like i thought it was weird because i'm like I posted your photos why do i not have more people following and liking my photos guys you also need to post so what you told us <laughs> i'm like dude i just posted a picture of this weird road and it was pretty sweet picture why don't people like it oh man and, and we didn't really understand you know like because it was the beginning of that whole thing and I think that there's a lot of lessons in there where it was like you hustled you went out of your way and you created different things that you made it work because you loved being on the road so much and there was like no other like Ashley said earlier there was no plan B like you were doing that and you did it and you did it however you could you know like I remember in the first place you're like I'll pay to come to Europe I did pay to come to Europe. That's what I mean. That's amazing. My favorite part was when an artist would use the fact they couldn't afford me as they're out and I wouldn't let them have it. I would find the email chain, but my response would always be like, hey, I'm fully prepared to make this happen. I just want to confirm that this is the only reason you can't, I can't come out on tour because I will solve this problem for you. But if this is just like a thing to put up to break it to me gently, like tell me the real reason because I'm going to solve this and I don't want another reason afterwards that I can't come on tour. And then I'll be like, all right, I'll pay for it. And they'll be like, okay, you can come and you just have to like force yourself but i remember looking at see again you don't realize how much of a rock star you are because i remember looking at you doing that and being like wow he's figured it the fuck out because you were selling your prints you had the most organized and put together print store i've ever seen to this day you made the algorithm that did not exist that and allowed so many photographers to also do that and take that path like you really started that for so many people including me like i'll be honest too just because you know you said you paid to go to europe like i my first big tour with bring me that i did when they took me out i didn't get paid a lot of money but i because of you i negotiated that i would be able to sell prints and i ended up making to this day more money off of that tour than i have on any other tour i've ever made because i sold prints because you did it for so long 2015 not to get dark but I in May of 2015 I had lost my best friend and I was going through a really rough time and I didn't really know what I was doing for the rest of the year as far as my tour plans because I had just come off of Pierce the Veil and uh, you put me on Pierce the Veil. Teamwork baby. <laughs> you work for me. I got a call from Kate Truscott offering me Warp Tour to go out and shoot for like it was like $700 a week shooting for Sennheiser and like having to hang up Sennheiser banners all over the fucking tour Every Wait, so morning. you know someone at Sennheiser? Yo, you got a plug? <laughs> but then that same day, I got asked to do the Bring Me Fall Run and like had negotiated all of that. And I just remember feeling like in disbelief because I was finally going to tour with them. And I had wanted to for so fucking long. And but yeah, I mean, it ended up working out and I toured with them for like a year and a half. And it was amazing and really grateful. And it was all but again, it was like the networking and the journey and like sacrificing to make it work and thinking I was going to make no money off that tour and it was going to be a one tour thing and then a week into the tour they offered me the rest of the cycle and i was like psych gotcha yes <laughs> coming with us but you're gonna pay me and they were like okay well and then i didn't sell prints after that or i think i i don't remember what I can did, i go but... back to the prince thing it was actually a pretty good <laughs> it was actually awesome but I mean, that being said, it, it's important to talk about this stuff because like it really is like making the sacrifice, making the investment in your time and in yourself and in your work and like putting yourself out there and just taking a shot. And like every time I did that in my career, and I'm sure the same with you, it always ended up working out. And I'm just really grateful for it. It was all just Fuck this yeah. like big puzzle piece. On that tour, were you solely photographer? Yeah. So like on that tour specifically, what did your day look like? Great transition. <laughs> I was smiling because I was like, he's going to fucking nail this transition <laughs> he's gonna do this guys i'm getting better at this come on you're doing so great besides not shitting on the bus 
you wake up typically, you know, 50% of the time, slightly maybe hungover. You, you know, I would usually drink a whole bottle of water in my bunk before I left my bunk and check my phone and uh, wake up usually around load in time or, you know, sometimes a little later, depending on the day or the band, because some people are sleeping until 2 p.m. Some people are, are awake at load in. So it just depends on who I'm with. Um, no, I'm just kidding. But yeah, load in, go to the venue, drag all my shit inside, find a place that I can set up all of my things, which is sometimes really difficult, depending on where you're at. Yeah, usually it's in production or directly in the green room, because that was just usually where it made sense. And then usually walk to go find the best nearby coffee. And if there's not coffee nearby, usually have a really rough morning of waiting for the runner to get Starbucks or something. But yeah, usually go on like a mini adventure with one of the band members or somebody in the crew and shoot a little bit specifically like I guess the last band I toured with was all time low so it was like me and Jack going on adventures every day for until soundcheck and then yeah soundcheck and then you know I think these days it's important to note too, like with content creation, usually I was doing social media for the artist while I was out there. So it's like getting the marquee shot in the morning and like making sure I'm getting those key assets that we need every day and like getting the tweet up if there's still tickets or if the show sold out or going and taking photos of the fans outside, things like that. Just like making sure the stuff around the venue was covered. I should probably include actual parts of my job. And not no, just you're good. I'm just my day of me fucking around. It's all good. All of it is viable. You said you shot the marquee like why would that be like a key asset for something for social media i don't know they just always wanted me to shoot it <laughs> just feels good aesthetic since you were doing the social media would you kind of like post those things like to i'd usually post it on like ig story just like tag the location so people knew we were there like you just never know yeah no that's just important and for me like it's that wouldn't be intuitive for me to think about and i think that's kind of a cool like little tip or trick you know for someone who's like kind of working for someone and creating content i always love doing the instagram story stories because it was like, you know, every day I'm kind of documenting, especially with All Time Low, it was really fun because I was like documenting their day every day kind of behind the scenes for the story. And like they had never really done that. So we got to kind of watch their fans engage a lot more that way. And then it was really cool because like every day at the start of the day, it was the marquee. And then I would always try to end the day with like a sign off or a photo of the crowd or something. And then it was like the next morning, it would start all over again. So it just looked really clean. And I just really liked doing it. And like kind of creating like that timeline too of like, yeah, this is the beginning of this day and this is where we are. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Always like messing around too and just getting funny content or annoying them by making them do liners or talk to, talk to Instagram. Do you know about that, Adam? Liners? Annoying the band or trying to make them do stuff like for you? like That they don't want to do? Yeah. Yeah, but the stuff I'm annoying them to do isn't for me. It's for their own good, but they just don't realize or want to acknowledge it. That's actually a better answer than mine. Yeah. I know we're paying you to be here, but don't fucking take a picture. Oh my God, there's like, I don't know if you deal with this, Ashley, but like at the end of the night, if you're a photographer and you work for an artist, Ashley will get to this. You like put all the photos in Dropbox and they pull them from there and they use them for their socials. I will get nights where like one member of the band be like, why are there less of me today and more? Don't and like, even. So I'd have to like literally like on certain nights, I'd have to omit photos of other people so that the ratio was on it. And I was like, you guys, just, I just take the photos. I'm sorry. I want to say names, but I am not going to say but names. But you know how this industry works. The first First time I went shooting with Neil was in Barcelona and I remember we like got all our gear together and went out to take photos and we get ready to take some photos and Neil goes, I don't have any batteries. I did. Yeah, that was. Dude, I remember my first tour. That was when I had, <laughs> yeah. that was when I was like, I'm going to start taking pictures. I had like a 5D Mark II or something crazy yeah. shit. Which will, at the time was like 2011, which a was a big like, deal. And it was sick and I felt so badass. I think I remember you posting photos you were taking on Twitter. I remember these days. Well, this is what I'm saying is like certain things can't be taught and I just didn't have it. <laughs> oh, man. You did great, Neil. Teamwork, baby. I try my hardest. You had a good teacher. I'm sure he would have taught you. He's probably embarrassed to say he was my teacher. All right. What do you do at Soundcheck? You get dinner. Band's on stage. You're getting dinner. Let's no, go. No, no. <laughs> Soundcheck, then dinner. <laughs> Soundcheck, shooting, IG, videos. Usually, I know like I used to like to plan out my shoot days a lot for that day. So I'd usually use Soundcheck to kind of go around the venue and kind of pre-plan like where I was going to shoot from what angles I really like, just like do a few laps and then also kind of figure out, I'm sure you can also relate, 
figuring out the easiest way to get from point A to point B. And also on a weird note that I feel like I want to talk about is like, I was in tour with Bring Me when everything happened in Paris at the Bataclan. And after that, I used to, it was really scary being over there when it happened. And I think we had a lot of crazy shit where like Brussels was shut down. It was a lot. It was very heavy. Security is heavy everywhere now. Yeah. After that, I remember like I would start, I would always know the exits at every venue. I, every day I would make sure like I knew, I, I was just very paranoid after that. I would also always make sure I knew like how to get from point A to point B, where all the exits were backstage in the venue, everything like, so I would just do a lap and then, yeah, and then be, basically do nothing until showtime. Everyone's just sitting backstage or we get dinner or whatever. I always felt like there was just a lot of time and it was really, you know, sometimes bands don't love taking photos so getting them to do photos in between the time from sound check to, to uh, show time could be a little difficult some days I, you know touring's hard yeah so it's like everyone's tired all the time so some days we would go do things and go out and about and some days we would just chill and I would just edit and be on my computer doing whatever and then show time or meet and greets Usually shooting meet and greet was always a fun one. After showtime, it's lightning mode editing and being bothered by everyone while I'm doing it, asking me when photos are going to be done. <laughs> because I'm working. This is what I'm doing. Or why are you choosing that photo and not that photo? Why? <laughs> why does this one only have one star? What's going on? Why don't you like that photo of me? So that was always fun. And that would slow down my process. So then we would, it would take me. No, I'm just kidding. I sound like such a dick. But usually that's how editing would go is people are coming to to see and like I always kind of loved it because people would be really excited to see the photos from the day usually and they were always really antsy to get the images to get them up on Instagram right away and then if I was doing social media I'm usually kind of running around getting approval and like caption approval like I'll just keep using all time low as a reference because I was the last band I toured with so it was like getting Alex or somebody from the band to approve the image and the caption for that night to go out um, we usually try to post right after the show I want to know what an image that band wouldn't approve would be I've seen <laughs> naked pictures of them that they chose to post <laughs> yeah it was it was usually pretty easy they're the best jack's like with like shaving cream on or something like in the shower tour story my first tour with my first show day with all time low somebody brought massive cutout heads of them to yes the venue. I was a little nervous. I didn't know them that well. I was sitting in the tour manager's office with Matt Jara. So they're about to get ready to go on stage. So we go over to the band's room and Jack grabs the cardboard cut out of his head and is screaming, running around naked. <laughs> and he goes, said something along the lines of, welcome to tour. Blink-182 broke all of us. We're all normal people. And then they came along and were like, it's okay to be like this. Yeah, that's usually what was going on behind the Sounds about it right. It was great. Naked people on tour. It's pretty normal, actually, I would say. Naked band humans on tour. Yeah, it's like your home. You got to feel comfortable. Got to be naked. I get asked about this a lot, and I think I should... I don't pull the woman card frequently, but I think I should address it for any woman who wants to tour as a photographer. It's like, people do ask me this all the time, just about like boundaries and people being naked. And it's like, I, it's never bothered me, and I've never been offended, and it's just a part of the job. And it's like, you know, just being really respectful of people's space. And like, I don't know if I can say this, but like that if somebody's naked around you, they like trust that you're not going to, I don't know. Yeah, there's a big trust there. And it's not like everyone, anyone was ever like naked for no reason. It was like the guy's changing. It's like, yeah, okay, great. And then like you have to run around for a bit. <laughs> Got to get your steps in. You, know? <laughs> you shed a few articles and you're way faster. No, but it was, yeah, I just feel like I have to address that as a girl on tour. It's like, it was never, it's never weird. Like there's just, it's always like this trust that is gets built up and I've never ever felt weird about it. I've, I've toured with one band that has a female singer and I've just never felt weird about touring with all of these men ever. Like it's always just been, I'm also like masculine energy. I'm also bi. So I'm not like, it's just never been a problem for me and I get asked about it all the time so I just wanted to address it girls are always like I don't want to tour with all these guys and I'm like it never phased me and it's never been weird and I've never had a problem and I've never I just love it it's really like so much brother sister energy it's never like been weird for me so yeah I just want to say that nice to hear whenever we were coming up it was like you saw those like videos of bands that were touring and they always had like those moments where they're like they run across the stage naked and like whatever and do this crazy pranks and all this other stuff and like I was just like yeah that's what you that's tour that's what you do <laughs> it's literally what if there's not like someone naked then it's like are you even touring you know if nobody's naked are you even on the road yeah exactly you know and i guess i'm, I'm like just thinking about this now and i'm like man 
it is a different thing. It's a, it's a weird thing. I never thought about it. I was trying to think like from the reverse perspective when I had toured with females as artists and I've only, yeah, I was trying to think if the female ever ran around naked and ever had that like, you know, energy. I grew up with sisters and they do. I had like, it was like me, my mom and two sisters and yes. Florida. But like the female I toured with was Lindsay Sterling and she's Mormon. So it was like probably the directly opposite. No, we should talk about that too, Adam. Like what was it like for you as a man touring with a woman like how, like how did you respect that boundary yeah it was just like i was trying to think i was like well she definitely didn't run around naked she was like pretty far from that right she is mormon raised mormon so like we couldn't swear on to her drink no caffeine I loved it because we got to play board games, which is like my no freaking caffeine. stomping grounds. Uh, Mormons don't do drugs. They don't caffeine counts. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. So you couldn't have coffee like even off? Not on the bus. They would get it, but it wouldn't be like available on the bus, if that makes okay, sense. Okay, okay, okay. I was like, I couldn't. <laughs> I would die. I've had eight shots of espresso today. <laughs> no, but like for her, it was more just making sure that she knew my intentions. She trusted me. And like I was kind of just a lot more cautious about when she was getting ready for the show and when she she would warm up in the bathroom a lot of the times with like her vi violin and so I was just like a lot more cautious and I would ask a lot more than I do with it was partly because she was a girl and I wanted to respect that boundary but it was mostly just because it's like a solo artist and I'm pretty much that way whenever it's a solo artist it's not like yeah anytime same. you're just one and one and one person it's different than I'm with like five dudes as I'm sure you can relate being with one person is a lot different energy than being with a group group of people. So it wasn't too much different, to be honest. It was just a different vibe whatsoever, but I, I wouldn't put it. It was more about like boundaries. Yeah, it was just boundaries. And I hadn't toured with her very often. And yeah, it was weird and not weird. It was just very new to me to be on tour with people who don't drink. Like I don't drink uh, much at all. Maybe I have like a bi-yearly beer, but that's about it. And uh, my girlfriend and I got a bottle of wine for Valentine's Day and there's this much gone. It's like so <laughs> you bad. you guys were probably like, wasted. Dude, we're going to be at this park for a while. We ordered a bunch of stuff off Amazon. Amazon. We don't remember. <laughs> We blocked out. <laughs> yeah. Do you feel like your day-to-day -day routine is similar to what I just explained or how is yours different? If I could sum up a music photographer, it's take pictures all the time, camera in your hand. The only difference is when you're editing your content. So when does your artist sleep? When does your artist wind down or not want to be photographed? And then that's when you sneak in your editing. The hardest part for me is when it's like with a DJ and they don't sleep and I'm like, dude, like you're just basically shooting and churning out content constantly. There's no like downtime. And at that point, and it's like never done DJ world. Oh, my God. I don't know if I could do it, man. I'm such a grandma. I mean, now, especially I'm like I'm in bed at like nine. I think I'm training to become a DJ now. <laughs> Because your daughter. Yeah. Daughter is DJ training. You have a kid. You don't sleep. When they become two years old, it's like you can go on tour as a DJ. I feel like I could probably work for one. I definitely can't create the music that they do because they're amazing. But what else, Adam? What else? What else do we need to ask Adam? No, no, no. Yeah. See, I, I really felt like you did a good job there. Maybe Ashley needs to be our third co-host. Just every once in a while, bring Ash on. Yeah. She just pops in and she's like, guys, she's like, ask the perfect question. So Adam, tell us. I know that this because I know you, but I, uh, you always talk about like, kind of like making time for yourself and kind of having that time. Like, I know that your, your time, Adam, is early in the morning when everyone's asleep. Is there, is there a time that you kind of do that, Ashley? Same. Yeah. That's usually my like coffee solo escape time. She's good at self-care. Yeah, dude. Oh my God. Bubble baths on days off was always my number one. I was going to say lush. Yeah, let's go. So much lush. Yes. Like walks, just so many walks. I've always really struggled. I think I've always really been open about my mental health, but I think on tour, it gets really hard for me to balance everything. So it's really, really important that I get out every day alone. And even if it's just 15 minutes, like hang solo. You know, what are you laughing about, Adam? I was inviting somebody on our podcast. Oh, there. Wait. All right. One second. I know who it's going to be. Oh, my boy. <laughs> oh, my boys. Wait, you guys get to be together? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> We exclusively share COVID. We share all diseases <laughs> together. But we don't we don't give it to anyone else. We just give it to each other. We give everything to each other. God damn it. <laughs> How are you guys are you, doing? Are you sure you wanted us on here? Yes. Ash was like, why are you smiling? I was like, just keep one second. I think they're going to come. <laughs> I love it. How are you guys doing? Hi, Neil. Hey, everyone. Hi. We are doing professional things. Good to oh, see y'all. Cool. I miss everybody I noticed so you guys haven't asked us to be on your podcast yet. We just didn't want to have someone say no. That's, we just try to like you avoid guys that. Talk about what it's like to be a tour photographer. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard work, man. It's a, it's a lot, you know. Getting the you made me get a photography Instagram, so 
I know, I know the perils. <laughs> we talked to Jeff yesterday, so we're just we're going, we had flies it last week, so we're just knocking it out. We're saving you guys for last. It's really just F eight and be there. You know, that's all there is to it. You know, the the F stops. Yeah. Oh, I get it. That's a photography thing, right? <laughs> I thought you were talking about a computer. <laughs> it's a Lightroom command or something. You know, it's some deep, deep shit. All right, we love you guys. Thanks for having us. Goodbye. <laughs> Maybe one day we could be on your podcast as well. <laughs> what a pleasant surprise. It's exactly as you would expect it to His be. His phone's name is Boyphone. I knew, as soon as I saw it, I was like, is this going to be Jack? I knew it right away. My boy. Oh, my God. Oh, I miss them, man. We do need to get him on the podcast. I don't know what they would talk about, being naked. Well, it's one of those things, too, where we have had almost all their crew, because it's, like, it's funny, because all the people that are on these podcasts with us are from like our extended touring family. And a lot of it is from our, the same groups of people because it's so small. Hearing that you had Jeff Maker on makes my heart so happy. He is one of the best people I've ever met on tour world. He is just like, oh my, he's one of a kind human. He really like, he's just the best. I have so many Jeff stories. Jeff was there for me for so many crazy times in life. Like he's just the best. He's a good dude. He was great to talk to also. Very concise and yeah. I do think you should share your daily routine, Adam, for people. My daily routine as a music photographer. All right, I will riff through it. Morning, wake up. Like Ashley said, self-care. I usually get up four hours before the artist. If it's a DJ, that's not possible. But with a day to remember, it's very doable. I usually go to bed, I would say one or two hours before them, but they don't do anything usually photo ready after 2 a.m. So I'll like stay up for the late night CeeLo game and pizza and then call it a night with DJ. It's like, dude, I'm just trying to survive. And <laughs> then like for, yeah, for a normal day, it's load in. I usually go into the venue and like play some video games and drink a little bit of coffee, work out and finish editing all my photos. Can I ask something really quick? Yeah. yeah Does yeah. a data remember have the craziest console ever? For a touring? Yeah. Like a crazy video game rig. No, not like bring me. <laughs> we do actually. So we started building it right before COVID happened. And then so the tour that got canceled because of the beginning of COVID, we didn't get to take it out. So we actually do have it's. I'm sorry, I interrupted. I just was curious. Oh, I I've care. seen some crazy video game situation. I know Avenge Semfold has their own room for it. Them and bring me have the coolest one. Yeah. yeah. We're definitely inspired by both of them. Well, Ollie games for real. That's all they did. <laughs> FIFA. We want to play more FIFA. You know how Drake called out Kanye and was like, yo, my pool's bigger than yours? Like, that's like the kind of competition that like we're trying to like start with like Bring Me and All Time Low. And they we're like, yo, we know you got like a video game rig, but like, look at this shit. Let's do a photo shoot for the rig and we'll do like a specs thing, like kind of like lay it all out. Like we got all this, put Amazon affiliates on everything. We'll just get paid. We say our video game rig is better than yours. Adam will creative direct this whole thing. Yeah, I love this. Continue with your uh, routine though. Sorry, interrupted. Yeah, guys, this is the podcast I put out about myself now. I mean, honestly, for the rest of the day, I mostly hang out with the band. I usually, I eat a lot more than the artists. So I'm frequent catering throughout the day. I eat pretty much constantly. And then I edit at the end of the night and in the morning. And other than that, like sound check, photograph them. I just hang out with them all day. Like we'll play Fortnite, play video games, go walk around. Like it's really just whatever the band's doing, I'm doing. And then with the exception of of, I spend a lot of time writing down what shots I need to get every day. So I like kind of like you were saying, you map out the venue. I do that as well. But then I also map out shots on a per song basis. Like I have like a timeline that I basically make marks on and say who I'm going to shoot every day for that artist. You talked about that before. And I used to do something similar because you said that once I used to like watch during tour rehearsal and note different parts of different songs that I thought the lighting was really great. You taught me that. That was oh, you. Hell yeah. I'm glad. Yeah, I'm glad that, you know, when you basically are trying to identify on a daily basis, like what can I do that stands out today? Because from the outside looking in, it can look quite monotonous. But from the inside, it's like you're working on these little things every day and trying to just get better and stay healthy, stay sane and maintain a relationship with the artist that is I'm professional, but also friendly. And like Neil said, like sometimes people get too comfortable. And I think that is a trap that people fall into on tour. And you notice that a lot. Like, I feel like that happens in movies and everywhere. It's like, oh, you work for this artist and the artist themselves is never going to be like, hey, you need to work harder. They're just going to fire you because that's not the artist's job. If it's going to come from a tour manager, it's going to come from management. And when you hear that, that means it's like you need to self check yourself a lot. And I think that's like self-discipline and routine. Like if I wanted, I could play video games all day and the band would 
probably just be like, where's Adam? But they're not going to be like, hey, you can't do this. They're just going to fire me, you know, because I can't take care of myself. At least that's what I think would happen. We wouldn't. Okay, well, they wouldn't. But with most artists, they'll be like, he's not doing his job. He's out. I mean, I've worked for them for 10 years. It's a little bit different of a situation. Well, we'd be right there playing video games with you. I would say that I could say what games we played based on what tour it is. We've done Minecraft, Diablo 2, Hearthstone, Fortnite. Diablo 3. I, I, oh, Diablo 3, not Diablo 2. Sorry, throwback. I think we did both. Uh, Yeah, D2, D3. I remember playing them in Luxembourg City. We basically literally show ends. We get food. We open our computers and play video games for four hours. That was what I was going to say is like, yeah, I know you guys say you look up to Blink, but one of the highlights of touring with you ever was when Mark walked in your room and told you guys that you were children. And I was like, that's awesome. He, uh, he told us the other, like I, I like did his little like Apple music show. He like asked me to be on for like a little segment. And one of the things he said about a day to remember, and he was like so proud of it. And it's so true. And I've said this to someone else and they completely agree. And I was like, oh, I never thought about it. He's like, a day to remember is like, if you gave a 13 year old a million dollars, like that's them. And I was like, yeah, that's a very great observation observation oh my god adam can i say one thing and it's allowed even though i'm not a photographer on tour yeah i think one thing that you do that i think is a really great thing that i think a lot of people that take pictures on tour could really benefit from is right before the band goes on stage get them together and take a photo because that's the best that they're gonna look because they're about to go on stage and they are in their hey look at me clothes you know hey look at me clothes <laughs> And they're together because as you all know, it's really hard to, it's like wrangling cats. You know, we, it's hard to do that. And then you all split and go to a stage right or stage left. And it, there's that, there's like a three minute period where you're all together. No, but I think that that's a really cool thing that you do. And I think that it's, uh, I hate it, but also I think it's important. And I think that if people did that, it'd be cool. Thank you so much, Ashley, for being on our podcast. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for helping me yeah, guys. interview Adam on what it means to be a tour photographer. Adam, you did a great job. Thank you, guys. I think that you did a really good job, too. God, I hope I helped. I You did great. That was awesome. I think you said it perfectly earlier. This is a really important conversation, and it was awesome that we were able to kind of get a lot of these things out, especially in the format of like storytelling and lessons and different things and it wasn't like hey do this when you're a photographer because you should it was really informative i think as a person i learned so much like and i like i said i've we've done a bunch of these and now i feel like i know i have so much more insight into what it means to be a photographer and how much work you guys do and how hard it is to do your job and how easy and effortless you guys make it so thanks for oh thanks for that thanks. Neil. well thank you guys and you know i really enjoyed this conversation it was really cool to talk about all the stuff with that Adam since again, like he's one of the reasons I even started wanting to tour. So it's hey, cool. I learn a lot from you too. So it's mutual. I appreciate all the compliments you gave during it. But even during this podcast, I learned a lot. And I know that a lot of people will learn a lot from you. And a lot of the people in the Patreon are female photographers too. And I think that that is something Yay. that I would say in the touring world that photographers are some of the most diverse. And that's not to say that uh, we don't have room to grow and get way more diversity going on. But I'm just happy that it's happening a little bit now, even more so than it was in the past. And I'm looking forward to helping change it more and more. I feel you. And I think after this like post quarantine world, you know, like think about everything that has happened. Like I know one black female photographer that's on tour. Like we, we have to get better. We just do as a whole industry. Like, and I think, you know, you starting the conversation the other day was really awesome. Like we said earlier, I think that after coronavirus, a lot about touring is going to change. And I think that it's really cool that we have that ability to almost get a fresh start where a lot of the shitty things that were, that sucked about touring can go away and they don't have to be here anymore and we can kind of all start not taking anything for granted all start appreciating even the worst parts of touring and really bring in a whole new generation of amazing people that really want to be here and really enjoy each other's company and really continue to gas each other up and support each other and do all these things together so I'm fucking hype. Me too. And on that note, our last thing we need from you, Neil, you want to... Okay, so Kevin Scaff, I'm the guitar player, you know, from our band. He was nice enough to create the intro and outro, which is the wheels on the bus, the nursery rhyme, but punk rock version. In your own words, could you ask Kevin to send us off with his rendition of the wheels on the bus? And on that note, take it away, Kevin Scaff. Woo! <laughs> <laughs>